Rockwell. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, uh, it is my great privilege to welcome everyone to today's event, which uh, fortunately we are able to host Minister Tang from uh, Taiwan, who's joined us today. I should note today's uh, event is being not only held in person, but it's also being live streamed. And actually what you see up here is uh, the minister has very kindly set up uh, as part of the live streaming, the opportunity to ask questions, submit questions online. So either please scan the uh, barcode um, or go to slido.com and have your questions coming in during the presentation. And at the end, when we open up to Q&A, uh, we'll take some of those questions online. So um, my name is Professor Ben Hopkins. I'm the director of the Seeger Center for uh, Asian Studies. Um, we are the University Center for Asian Studies, and we have a long-lasting and close relationship with TECRO and a uh, great interest in Taiwan, and so it's a great privilege today to welcome you all to one of our annual Taiwan events. Um, that's really all I have to say, except to introduce Deepa Lapali, who is today's moderator, and we'll introduce the minister. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, I'm really honored to be able to do the introduction for Minister Audrey Tan. Uh, when I was looking at her bio, there's so many things that one could talk about. Uh, the first word that came to my mind was, wow. So here's somebody who has that wow factor, if I may. Um, Minister Tang is the first uh, digital Minister of Taiwan, and I would say one of Asia's most innovative and exciting thought leaders and activists on uh, governance and the use of digital space for that. Uh, Ms. Chang serves on the Taiwan National Development Council's Open Data Committee, the K-12 Curriculum Committee, and she also led Taiwan's first e-rulemaking project. Uh, Ms. Chang works on a variety of, uh, of uh, consulting uh, with Apple, uh, works with uh, Oxford University Press on crowd lexicography, and with social text on social interaction design. Um, also, uh, actively still contributes to Gov, Gov Zero, a vibrant community uh, with a call to fork the government, and I wanted to make sure I didn't mispronounce that word. <laughs> <laughs> Careful to say that. Um, let me just say a few things uh, uh, about uh, Minister Chang that uh, I found particularly interesting. Uh, Ms. Chang started her um, work with computers at a very early age. I think the first thing that she did was uh, uh, create an educational game for uh, 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 Minister's younger brother. Also showed, I think, a lot of personal courage uh, because at 15, uh, left school with the blessings of the head teachers and went on to start a company uh, of, of many companies along the way. And um, at the ripe old age of 33, I think, decided to retire from private sector and uh, focus on the public sector. And so, um, really want to do, I think, what uh, uh, the minister has called deliberative democracy, to start that kind of a movement on that. And finally, when, um, in 2016, when the minister was asked to be the first digital minister and join the government, apparently she was asked to write a job description. And I happened to read the job description online. It was a poem which was, I think, uh, very innovative, very inspirational, and very intelligent, and kind of irreverent and fun. And I have a feeling that those uh, words probably describe the minister herself, personally and professionally. And so um, with that, I would uh, invite you to come up and tell. Just one small uh, thing I just also wanted to mention that I haven't if you look around the room, there are some very interesting uh, photographs that uh, Chekro has kindly brought with them. These are in the back, on these easels in the back, and some of them ha are, have photos of the minister uh, as well. 
engaging in dialogue between US and uh, Taiwan on some uh, things that some of you may know about, the GCTF and so forth, which has been at the forefront of fighting fake news, which certainly in Washington it would be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here uh, to share with you some stories, and I see that people online have, or even in the room, have already started asking questions. And so uh, many of my people do like each other's questions. The question is the most number of likes below to the top, and the uh, top questions um, get answered faster, like this one. So, um, what does fork the government even mean? Um, so, in uh, computer programming, fork means taking something that's going to a direction and change its governance model by splitting the governance committee and developing it in the other way. But it doesn't actually destroy the original work. It actually creates a copy. And so you hear it in Bitcoin, um, blockchain governance, and other uh, ways that basically says, you know, take something and run to a different direction with a hope to merge in the future. And so the GovZero community does that professionally. Um, GovZero is a domain name. That is literally G0BW. And for each of the government services that the GovZero activists doesn't like or think the government should do but haven't been doing, uh, the GovZero activists does a shadow government website. So, for example, the legislative is ly.gov.gw. And so, um, predictably, the shadow legislative in GovZero is ly.g0b.gw. So, it solves the discovery problem. You don't have to Google search for anything. You just take an existing government website, change an O to a zero, and get to the shadow government. And the government uh, that's built by the GovZero always relinquish copyright. So, by the next procurement cycle, the government can just merge it back right in. And I'll show a few examples of the GovZero project that became national websites and national services. And so it's a way to gently push the government by creating essentially a standby version that is the fork of the service that is in, with the intention to be merged back. So keep the questions coming because we're now at zero questions. Uh, we can uh, ordinarily programmed slides, which is my talk. All right, so um, today um, I would like to talk about the shared values in the US-Taiwan relations and strengthening democracy through open governance. Now, um, just to, to begin things, uh, when we talk about crowd sourcing or crowd collective intelligence and things like that, usually what we say is that it's a consultation about a specific domestic matter. Very rarely do we share the real agenda setting power of what exactly are we going forward, why we're going forward, the, the important priorities and so on uh, in an online way and mostly because of trolls. Now um, in Taiwan we've been perfecting the tool that was originally developed in uh, San Francisco I think and Seattle uh, called Polis. And Polis is basically an AI moderated conversation that lets people resonate with each other's things without the possibility to troll. Uh, and so um, just last week actually we launched with the AI team the first of its kind, a digital dialogue of how Taiwan's role in global community can be promoted and we just crowdsource people's ideas and there's zero trolls so far, just hundreds of very useful suggestions. And so if you go to talkto.aid.org.tw, you can see the system. The system very simply put is that when you get there, you see one statement from a fellow, for example, Dr. Paris Templeman uh, from Stanford, um, and you can either agree or disagree with that statement, but there's no reply button. And as you press agree or disagree, uh, it should, the next statement shows up, and you can just press agree or disagree. And as you do that, the avatar with the blue circle moves along uh, the axis of different accounts. Uh, you can see how close you are to your social media friends and so on, and it produces automatically a chart uh, that lists the divisive statements as well as the consensus statements. Now, most of the social media and the mainstream media over-focus on divisive statements and um, essentially waste people's time um, because people are not going to agree overnight on the divisive statements, but actually letting people have a reflective view of what people's really consensus are um, gives us a pointer of which that we can say most of people do agree on most of the things most of the time. 
And that enables the UN's climate relations to go forward because by the end of each two month cycle, the AIT will run a public forum that invites live experts and AIT personnel to discuss the top um, resonating statements and how it may be integrated into the US climate relationship. And so the four panels is going to be the four topics the next uh, eight months or so, and uh, I welcome everybody to participate. And one of the most resonating statements, call it red here, um, is from Dr. Templeman here, so I'll just read it aloud. Um, Taiwan is on the front lines of global confrontation with authoritarianism. Taiwan can work with the U.S. to promote our shared values of protection of rule of law, freedom of speech and assembly, religious tolerance and pluralism, and the voice of ordinary citizens in government. And I think this kind of system explains a part of our voice of ordinary citizens in government. Um, but of course, the other shared values are very important as well, especially that we're really in the front line on authoritarianism. Um, this is from a, a website called the Civicus Moment, uh, where human rights activists use uh, to monitor how free uh, any given country are, and it's in the level of open, narrow, obstructive request to close based on uh, how many human rights violations or violations on uh, freedom of speech and assembly and incidents and so on. And as you can see, in our part of the world, Taiwan is really the only place that can be called it fully open, meaning that there's no obstruction whatsoever on people's freedom of speech and assembly. And so this is in direct contrast with a nearby uh, jurisdiction, uh, the PRC, uh, which is evolving very quickly to a different direction. Um, and so I'll just make a couple quick contrasts. Uh, for example, uh, with the relationship between the state and the citizen, um, people have perhaps heard of the social credit system that is covered with a mandatory education app, uh, and uh, that is in the PRC, and people are blocked by freedom of traveling and assembly and so on um, because of their lack of confirmation through the social credit system. Whereas in Taiwan, we use exactly the same internet technology, but the other way around, we make the government transparent to the people. And this is the inaugural Gut Zero project, actually. It starts as project.gutzero.jw. This shows an interactive chart of all the different budget items in the national budget. And people can drill down to each of the thousands of year-long projects and see all the KPIs, all the procurements made, all the different assessments that the National Government Council did, and so on, and read real-time commentary. Now, where, well, back in 2012, it's the commentary is mostly people chatting among themselves. Now, it's part of the national regulation. So, in the e-participation center, join the GOV.GW, not only you can see the budget, but you can also participate in the agenda setting. And once people, you know, comment on any piece of budget, the public, Korea Public Service dedicated to just respond immediately without actually going through, you know, persons like um, the MPs or the mainstream media. And that actually enabled the MPs and mainstream media to have a lot more open source intelligence and uh, to work on top of that to give more um, good investigative reporting. And the public service doesn't have to pick up 30 phone calls one after another asking about the same thing, essentially. And so um, while there was initially some resistance, now uh, all the different ministries have adopted. Um, and so you can see virtually all our budgets there. And so making the government transparent to the people, not the other way around. Um, and uh, another contrast would, could be made between the uh, state and the private sector, uh, whereas, as we understand, uh, that now even in Hong Kong, but mostly in PRC, any company above a certain size need to have a CCP or party branch. Um, now, in, in Taiwan, uh, it's in the other way around. Um, our regulatory co-creation system, our sandbox system, is designed so that instead of the party or the ruling party or the uh, state directing the direction of the companies as those party branches are left to do, uh, we ask the companies to essentially break regulations and let us know about it. The sandbox system is just uh, designed so that anyone can work with any municipality and say, hey, I want to experiment in the platform economy, and AI-based banking, and self-driving vehicles, and whatever, that our regulators do not think about. And so we agree to not find them or punish them for a year. Uh, but in return, they must engage in open innovation and share all the data and the assessments with the wider public. And so by the end of the year, if the public thinks this is a good idea, then it becomes regulation, basically. And if the public doesn't think it's a good idea, well, we thank the investors for paying the tuitions for everyone, and the next innovation needs to 
to start somewhere after that, right? And so uh, this is basically the kind of research innovation we lead in the regulatory innovation. Uh, it's uh, Nia in the UK was in tech, but we're now really using this model for pretty much everything. And so um, as um, Vice President Pence said in the last October, I believe, Taiwan's embrace of democracy shows a better path for all the Chinese people. Indeed, I would say all people. Uh, but on, on, on the other hand, this actually creates a contrast to the kind of legitimacy or lack thereof of uh, the PRC, and which is, I think, partly why the PRC have been um, kind of aggressive uh, lately. Uh, and this background is kind of a inside joke. It's a <laughs> censorship of a pretty harmless uh, popular game um, called Devotion on the S team, uh, on the Steam um, gaming platform, just because the, the red seal there um, happened to contain the, the name of um, the, the President Xi Jinping. Uh, and and that, that's the only reason. Otherwise, it's a, it's a really harmless game, uh, but they get censored uh, nevertheless. Um, and we see a lot of such kind of um, bravado uh, and uh, all sorts of different confrontations and even you know, flying the, the jets uh, over the middle of the street and things like that. And I think none of these are projection of power. None of these are power projection. They are projection of insecurity. And so, uh, but of course, Taiwan is not um, alone in facing such uh, aggressions, uh, especially around the AIP authority event. We have many, many supporters uh, coming from the US and we launched the digital dialogue even though when, what the day we launched the digital dialogue, there's large-scale military action in our surroundings by the PRC. I think that, again, shows the insecurity. But in any case, um, we, we are very welcome, uh, our international like-minded countries, uh, in support of furthering our democracy. And so I'll just um, say a couple things about protecting the security of our democracies that we've been developing in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, first, we're securing our elections against uh, foreign tampering. And foreign tampering um, takes many, many forms. It could take forms of precision targeted advertisement over social media or regular media. Um, and this is actually something that we've seen worldwide, uh, that people basically weaponize social media in order to influence uh, elections. I think that is also um, because Taiwan has one of the world's most advanced campaign donation law, the most transparent one, so that all the donation report is actually going to be released, I think this June, uh, for the previous election in machine readable format, it essentially Excel spreadsheets, and like individual records, not just the summaries and so on. And because we're that transparent, that means that people, uh, and of course only domestic people can donate to campaigns, and so um, people with other means of influence uh, usually choose advertisements over campaign donations uh, in order to support uh, their candidates. And so we're changing our laws, quite a few laws. Um, we introduced the equivalent of the Honest App Act here uh, in Taiwan's legal system. It's currently in the parliament, going to be passed soon, that will code campaign donations and uh, advertisement over social or any other digital media uh, to the same standard for radical transparency. And we're making sure uh, that any disinformation campaign, the narrative gets exposed, uh, and uh, we develop a notice and public notice system uh, partnering uh, with the E2E encrypted chat application vendor Line uh, in order to put digital accountability so that when people see us spreading disinformation, there is a counter uh, narrative showing in the same tab in the same app, and that we attach such clarifications in real time in partnership with our civil society fact checkers. And in this, I think the US has played a really good role, a positive role, through the GCP uh, training framework. I think uh, I'm in that photo. That's why we train the journalists in the Indo-Pacific region, not just bilaterally, but everybody in the region about how to um, expose this information, how to basically communicate effectively when there is a information um, manipulation campaign. And the GEC, the Global Engagement Center, has also provided ample funding opportunity for the civic tech uh, and other developers in the private and social sector to develop competent measures of the, for this regard, and we're very grateful about that. Um, and of course, we're also working on cybersecurity. You may have heard that uh, just last week uh, we published uh, the so-called blacklist of uh, you know, non-security devices finding the use in uh, government properties and other government personnel and people working in critical infrastructures. And this is actually just the latest of the progression of development. I remember around six years ago when we 
which is Bitcoin in the four G networks, um, there was a question from why not get like you know efficient ven vendors that were that they could use devices from the DRC and our National Security Council and the National Implementation Commission at the time uh, decided that while they are market players uh, at that point, uh, when there is an escalation, um, everybody knows that the DRC market actors become non -market, non market actors through one mean or another. And so because of that, uh, during the 4G deployment, we said explicitly that uh, nobody in crypto infrastructure or communication infrastructure in 4G should use DRC components, market actor or otherwise. And so of course we continue to think about G and now people are waking up to it. We're really happy that people are waking up to it. Um, and so uh, we of course, uh, again, work closely with the US um, automated indicator sharing um, to assert that we can do an emergency rapid response team and things like that. And we also share our training frameworks. But of course, protecting the uh, facilities and institutions of democracy, the basic cybersecurity and election security is really so that we can build innovation. And the innovation that I'm particularly in charge of is called the open governance. Uh, and um, the US, of course, is the founding member of the Open Government Partnership. Currently, we have four national action plan uh, from the uh, Trump administration. And we use the same um, ideas of open government um, internally in Taiwan as well. That is to say, to make the government transparent, participative, accountable, and also inclusive in the sense that we bring the technology to the space of people rather than asking people to come to the space of technology. And so uh, perhaps unique in the world, uh, we established what we call the participation officer network. I think the Vitaler is, is copying this network uh, with the Ministry of Direct Democracy. But the idea is very simple. In every ministry, there is a team of people, just like officers talking with media or officers talking with the parliament. There's officers talking with emergent issues that are going to be uh, networked collective action. And so basically we meet with the protesters uh, before they actually go to the street because maybe they just want an invitation to the kitchen, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, we could create solutions on any and all uh, emergent social and cross-ministerial interagency issues. Indeed, my office uh, is at 22 people, and in Taiwan's 32 ministries, I can coach at most one person from each ministry. Uh, and so this is an entirely horizontal, uh, cross-cutting, interagency digital strategy. And the field network, the extended network, um, is about 100 people strong in each and every ministry. So whenever there is a, for example, e-petition and so on, we work on collaborative meetings that invites all the stakeholders together and we indeed travel to the place. For example, this is Hengchun, the southness of Taiwan, a popular tourism place. They petitioned, many thousand people petitioned for the deployment of Black Hawk helicopters to their local airport to serve as ambulance cars because they're like 90 minutes away from any major hospital and I think accidents are sometimes fatal because of that. And, but the Ministry of Health and Welfare has said, okay, we apply for a larger hospital and a different um, you know, um, deployment, but there's no uh, funding from the NDC. Maybe the NDC can consider working with the Ministry of Transportation, and the transportation said, building a faster highway, uh, we're still evaluating on that, maybe not this year, uh, the budget is really not there, maybe the aviation um, community can say something, the aviation community says we don't have uh, extra black box in the Ministry of Interior, maybe the Ministry of Defense can say something, and, and so on. And this is the usual shape of interagency things. But because of participation um, officers now with the PO network, we have on the regulatory level a what we call the ice bucket challenge clause that says if an agency or ministry A thinks B should own it, or B thinks C should own it, C thinks D and D thinks A should own it, then I'm sorry, but everybody travels to Hengchun, everybody owns it. And so um, like six, seven actually, ministries all traveled with me uh, to Hengchun and we met with all, all the local stakeholders using exactly the same live stream and Slido and so on technologies to pinpoint exactly the common values across all those different positions and we understood finally that people want to trust their local clinicians more and at that time they don't even have the place uh, to serve as dormitory or to do training and so things like that. And so we settled on a plan that is actually what we call Pareto improvement that leaves nobody worse off and, and improves people's life generally. And because it is live streamed, so the legitimacy is really, really high. People can really see that all the different factors 
connections locally have after summoning us uh, to a function, uh, agreed on this solution. So I talk with the premier. Every couple weeks we do a collaboration meeting and the next Monday I meet with the premier and send a synthetic document to the premier's office. And so they committed like really a large amount of money, um, I think uh, 400 million uh, Taiwan dollars or something to uh, really uh, drastically rebuild that local hospital facility and fly over uh, the, the doctors from Kaohsiung uh, to train there instead of flying people to Kaohsiung, which of course this new solution is much safer. Uh, and so in OCP, this PWP or for the uh, three or so uh, cases uh, that we've done this in a radically transparent manner. And so um, actually I joined the cabinet to work with not for the government. And so there was uh, three conditions of me working in the cabinet um, and that are radical transparency. Everything that I hold as a chair, every meeting that I convene, uh, we publish the entire transcript 10 days, um, 10 working days now to the internet and location dependence. I will get to work anywhere. And so this is my office in Social Innovation Lab in Taiwan and anyone can apply for a 40 minutes chunk of my time as my office hour every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And the only condition is that we need to agree that we need to publish our conversation online, and so that's my office hour. Uh, and finally, voluntary association. As I said, I don't command uh, my colleagues. They come literally from each and every ministry. So we use pure horizontalism to make sure that we figure out projects that are of use of everybody. So the regional social innovation uh, organization tour, uh, which we reinvent on our way using the sustainable logos that we really put everywhere on name card and t-shirts and whatever. Uh, we make sure that we travel to the local social innovators working on one or more SDGs and telecommunicate uh, back to the social innovation lab and making sure all the 12 ministries are there and so people see each other across the screen and can really solve across ministry of issues that are related to regional revitalization. There's many, many other networks internally that we're expanding outreach and even citywide um, participation officer networks. And so this methodology we of course publish on the socialarchive.org uh, and as papers and also as comic books. That's our training material in six languages, including indigenous. And uh, so because all, everything is publicly online, we do get a lot of inquiries from civic tech and gov tech communities in all these great cities that are uh, experimenting with this kind of open governance. And so we have lots of allies, we run workshops, and we're very happy to share our um, open governance approaches uh, in the Indo-Pacific and also abroad. So I would just like to conclude uh, with the new um, consultation platform that the AIT and Taiwan has established together, the Indo-Pacific Democratic Governance Consultation. I think uh, the first one will be in September around the human rights and other issues concerning regional democracy. And we're very happy to share what we have learned regionally and do whatever we can to assist others around the world for pursuing progress in their own countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, really vivid uh, talk. Uh, all I can say is that it's too bad we can't clone you and uh, send you across the globe <laughs> to start this kind of a, of a movement. Well, uh, following the minister's uh, talk, we have uh, two of my colleagues from uh, George Washington University to uh, give a short uh, commentary and some reflections on uh, digital space and governance issues and their own um, uh, views on some of this, their own findings to round out the, um, the remarks. So first we will start with uh, Dr. Susan Aronson. She's a research professor of international affairs at the Elliott School. She's also a senior fellow at the Think Tank Center for International Governance Innovation in Canada. Um, she, Susan is currently directing projects on digital trade and protectionism 
also works on artificial intelligence and trade and a new human rights approach to data. So she will, it, it dovetails very nicely with what the uh, minister just laid out. And she holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. Um, following uh, Dr. Aronson, uh, Dr. Scott White will uh, give his remarks. He is an associate professor here uh, at, at uh, George Washington, and also he directs the new cybersecurity program and cyber academy, uh, which is a uh, very interesting um, a new educational um, platform. Dr. White holds the Queen's Commission and was an officer in the Canadian Forces Intelligence Command. So uh, he uh, brings a, a, a security background to this uh, discussion as well. Um, after he did his PhD, he was an officer with the Canadian Security Intelligence Agency. Uh, he has consulted with a variety of law enforcement agencies uh, across the uh, globe, um, and uh, he holds a PhD from the University of Bristol in the UK. So with that, let me ask Susan to lead off. Hi everybody and nice to see you here and thank you Minister Perrin. Um, it's an honor to follow you um, given all the good you've done in the world. Um, so Deepa asked me to try to focus my presentation on thinking about this in the context both of my own research and also of China and China's thank you. I should know this by now, right? I need a mic. Um, but I've decided to do something different from what Deepa asked which was um, and what I'd like to do is put it in a larger context of the world in which we live today and the role of technology. And then what can the United States and aging democracies learn from this vibrant and new democracy? And I, um, I, the reason I'm, I'm saying that is because I used to teach corruption. And when I taught it, um, I learned that um, attacking corruption is all about trust. It's all about building trust and forging anti corruption counterweights built on trust. And so it's in that context that I'll comment on um, some of the innovations that Minister Perrin has done. So thinking about this in terms of technologies, um, we, we can be techno-optimists or we can be techno-pessimists, and I'd rather be neither, because I think technologies, especially data-driven technologies, have given us both the best and the worst of times. And I would say today, almost every democratic society, from Sweden to Taiwan to the United States, is threatened by corruption, inequality, terrorism, and technology tools that both improve our lives and threaten our quality of life. And one reason I think is that these new technologies contribute to a decline in trust and a rise in distrust, right? They're not the same thing. Um, two very distinct things. And trust is the social capital that enables good governance and the rule of law. But no one knows how to build trust once it's lost, okay? And that, I think, is a, the key problem if you want to achieve good governance. So let's compare the United States and Taiwan. Trust in government has been declining, and in institutions in the United States has been declining for a really long time. Um, in Taiwan, it seems to be, I mean, obviously in some areas it's declining, but in other areas it's on the rise. So Minister Chang has said her approach builds on trust, and her premise is, from what I read that you wrote, is that the gov if the government trusts the people with agenda-setting power, then the people can make democracy work. <laughs> right. And so what has she done to achieve that objective? And that, that again, I'm not criticizing it. I want to highlight it. Uh, so she created a multi-pronged strategy, an infrastructure for a more effective feedback loop, right? So individuals can influence government, and government hopefully hears what the people are saying and responds to it. And I think her idea of participation officers is really quite brilliant. Um, the problem is it does nothing to really build that trust. And I think that's something that we need to figure out how to do in a time of disinformation, 
misinformation, right, which is another different thing, and also in the effects. Another thing that Taiwan has done, and the minister spoke about this, is using crowdsourcing to improve law and regulation. And a lot of governments have been experimenting with this. I'm ambivalent about it, um, because it tends to be special interests that care about this that are involved in it. Nonetheless, I think it can build the trust. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm ambivalent. On one hand, you don't get average people, mm -hmm. but you do get them to see that government is responsive and you get them involved. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really good thing. Um, but, um, and I think it also seems like it started to work on issues in Taiwan. That is really instructive consensus approach built on dialogue. Okay, it's interesting to see, I did, um, okay, this is a lie, my research assistant did it, but um, we looked at where is Taiwan in terms of open government, governing data, and honestly, to my amazement, Taiwan, if you, if you like beauty contests, rankings, perception metrics, Taiwan ranks number one in the Open Data Governance Index score. And that's pretty impressive. So all those things are things that Minister Chang has achieved and Taiwan has achieved. But I wanna just put it in the larger context of technological change and then I'll shut up. I think misuse of data is forcing us to rethink a lot of things that we took for granted as goods. And good number one is trade. In terms of trade, every government, and believe me, I've been looking, I've spent two years looking, um, every government has some degree of what I call data nationalism. They want to control certain types of data, and they have all sorts of excuses, because it's personal data, because it's uh, secret data, et cetera. Um, and that challenged us to rethink whether or not openness is an inherent good, and trade is an inherent good. Um, and we have to think, what is a barrier to data openness and what isn't? What is necessary public policy? Um, so that's just something to think about, and I don't know if Taiwan has thought about that. Number two, um, more and more companies, and I, strangely enough, these companies happen to be US and Chinese, um, are organizing and owning more and more of the world's data. And I find that deeply scary, and I don't understand why more and more scholars are not thinking about this. Um, so Google's mission, as an example, is to organize the world's data. That's the mission statement of a company? Is that appropriate? And that company, which I think aims to do good, but certainly doesn't in everything, has um, so much of the world's public, personal, and proprietary data. And just so that you know it, anytime a company takes your, uh, your personal data and creates you know, an algorithm and tries to come up with whether it's an ad or it's a solution to a problem, that company owns that solution and owns that data. And so, all, so, so much of our data and so much of the solutions to many of the world's problems are gonna reside in companies. And that's gonna have huge effects on democracy, but it's also what we call information asymmetry. If you study economics, and other nations and companies can't effectively challenge the market power of these firms. Um, and then finally, we have seen some of these firms, such as Facebook and Twitter, have become tools that both, on one hand, support democracy and undermine democracy. And more and more, these companies are being asked to the job of government. And what do I mean by that? That is to de make decisions about data. So your data and my data, but also data that is essential to knowledge, um, they have to make decisions as to when to take it down and how to take it down and what to take down. And I find that deeply disturbing. In the future, we're gonna need strategies that better help the public govern these companies as well as our governments better understand data use and misuse, better understand the mixing of public proprietary and personal data sets. And how will democracies like the United States and Taiwan educate our citizens about this? I have no idea, but I do know this, that that is going to be an essential good governance and open governance question. Thank you. All right, thank you.
teaching my new research at least. Um, and now uh, to Scott White for uh, further context and however he wants to uh, contextualize that. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Minister, they were lovely words. Um, these are challenging times um, for me personally. They're challenging times because I built a career on secrecy. I was in the intelligence services and secrecy of information is what we do and what we collect. But ultimately, somewhere along that chain, you have to disseminate that information. Intelligence officers realize that at some point along the continuum, that information that's going to be of value must be disseminated to other partners to share and then operationalize. So that in itself is a dichotomy for me, having spent my career in secrecy, to now find the optimal path is one of openness. You're challenging me, Minister, at my very core. The problem we have is government's need to confront the challenge of cyberspace whilst being equal and just, preserving innovation, and honoring the social contract that it has between the citizens and the state, whilst at the same time maintain security. Responsible governance then is new to cyberspace, but ultimately imperative. The model that our friends in Taiwan have expressed, one of openness and accountability, is a utopian state for us. But how do we get there? How do we get there, sir? How do, ma'am, ladies and gentlemen, how do we get there? How do we get there whilst at the same time have security? We are confronted by a government, Madam Minister, we're right beside you, that has spent a great amount of time, a great amount of money, in creating probably the most dynamic social security force that we have seen. China has been very open with its concept of cyber sovereignty and the desire to extend its own um, ideas and its own uh, uh, ways of, of social governance uh, to the cyber world. And they are in the midst of building the most extensive governance regime for cyberspace and information telecommunications that any country has seen in the world. Recognizing that technology and the, and the advances that are being made so quickly cannot be controlled relatively, relatively easily by government. So as we have the expansion of technology, the growth of technology, so too do we have the desire to control in China. This, this leads us to a variety of issues that we have to deal with. How do we, in democratic societies, advocate for openness whilst at the same time one of our large adversaries is moving mountains to create an environment of security and dare I say even social oppression. When we do an audit, in uh, uh, a security audit for Beijing, we find that the extent to government is well beyond that of just the society, just beyond the local governance through to companies. And we see this presently in my own country of Canada, when well, the Americans asked for the arrest and detention of the vice president of Huawei. Huawei has just moved to 5G. Will we meet them there? Against this challenge then, against this challenge, we have a government that is uh, expansionist. We see China mobilizing in much of Africa now to assist the developing world in large projects, whilst at the same time, we see Chinese government control in those societies. The social contract is there for China and its people. The social governance that they extend through the Communist Party makes it very clear the ambitions of the Chinese government. How then, how then do we confront this government? Whilst at the same time, 
as the minister has said, create an open, honest environment for the people. That's not just an academic question for us. It is a real life question. It is a real life question because democracy is being challenged around the world today. In fact, dare I say, it is being even challenged here. Dare I say, when we have a president who on occasion will ask members of his cabinet to engage in activities which we would deem not prejudicial to the best interests of the democracy. I know that we're going to go to questions, so I won't spend too much time. But the challenge again for us is how do we create a secure environment? We know that model. Our friends in China are very, are very cognizant of the model they use. It is the largest model that we see. Taiwan and India have introduced a new model for us. The Taiwan model, one of openness, fairness, accountability, all the things that we would like to see. And yet, on the other hand, we have a very aggressive state moving equally as dynamically uh, throughout the world to impose a different system. How do we engage in the cyber world, commerce, democracy, it is probably the greatest democratic tool we have right now. How do we engage there whilst at the same time protect our national security? And therein, protect the values that we share here in the United States, which we share with our friends in Taiwan, openness, justice. All of the things that we were raised on, all of the things that our security forces spend a career maintaining. This is the dichotomy. This is the problem that we are confronted with. This is ultimately the challenge for security services. I'll leave you with that and move the floor to taking questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. I think I'm delighted that uh, we have two commentators who one have coming from much more uh, radical openness to a more tempered uh, uh, set of uh, uh, views that are necessary to raise, I think, at this uh, forum. So I think, Ms. Chang, you've uh, opened a, 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 an extraordinary conversation here that we have now uh, a variety of ways in which to address it. And I know there are many questions. I don't know what the, uh, I can't see behind me, but what kind of questions we have coming up. But um, I'm, I'm, if you don't mind, I would actually like to take the first question, although I know there are many questions out here, I can't resist. And it's a, it's a sort of a straightforward question for you, and that is the fact that this kind of open governance and your innovative um, system that you've introduced provides, I think, Taiwan a very important, what I would call soft power. In the international arena, regionally in particular, especially when, as you lay out the difference between the PRC and Taiwan, there is that huge a symmetry of soft power, I think, in your favor. How does one, because I teach, uh, you know, you look at these things and how important is soft power at the end of the day, and I can see them here. Um, how do you, uh, Ms. Chang, how would you formulate the use of soft power in projecting Taiwan in the international and regional setting? So uh, my, my main current um, literally has a picture uh, of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which are there also, and prints underneath it uh, the slogan, Taiwan can help, which is the trending hashtag in Taiwan occasionally. Um, and so Taiwan can help, I think, summarizes um, how we're posturing to the international community, um, basically saying that in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, because it is collectively agreed by PRC alike, uh, by year 2030, we're going to focus on 169 issues in 13 categories. But mainly, the issues are structural, and they can only be solved if, across sectors, people have reliable data, people can build partnerships on the reliable data, and if the innovation is open. And Taiwan starts to offer um, in medical um, governance, in um, the 
air quality and water quality and what we call the Siegel IoT system and so on, with all built uh, in an open source way, systems that people can readily use without getting controlled uh, by people in Taiwan. So you don't have to be subservient to, to our um, innovations and knowledge to use and contribute to our open collaborative uh, innovations. And so that's the, actually the main message uh, during the UNGA that was in New York uh, that I sent to our uh, partners and my counterparts in, in all countries that um, you know in any and each sustainable development goals, there is models in Taiwan that we can offer to help in non-colonial way. Okay, thank you so much. All right, um, the floor, I will now open the floor uh, to questions as well as the virtual space here. Mm -hmm. um, Anyone from the audience? Because uh, in the French, always just uh, our name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and when you ask the question, please do identify yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, you gentlemen. I think we have a. Yeah. Hi, it's Neil Bosch, and I'm a disaster researcher here in northern Taiwan and Japan. I have a question for Dr. Erickson, I think. How do you deal with this conflict I see between soft power and trade? Uh, when President Trump just put in the tariffs against China. There was a big article in the paper about a soybean farmer out west who's really upset because now he can't sell his soybeans to China and get the money he wants. And it seems like that fellow really doesn't care that China is throwing those things into concentration camps or undermining universities around the world. He just wants to sell the soybeans and make money. So how do we how do we deal with that? How, how can that be addressed with this way that, that trade in a way is undermining the whole democratization Our, our part is, I think, Lemon said, what did it say, the uh, capitals for sell you the rope that you can use to hang on us, that kind of thing? Um, <laughs> actually, my true area of expertise, the bulk of my research has been on the relationship between trade rules and human rights. And um, it's very difficult to measure how trade affects human rights, right? And I think your question is such an important one very much appreciate it, but I think you're conflating two very different things, if I may. First thing is, should the, t is the problem that the farmer doesn't think about the connections between trade and human rights? Is the problem that George, uh, excuse me, that Donald Trump um, doesn't care about human rights and uh, is using trade policy as his main tool to bash a wide range of countries, including our allies? Is the problem um, that um, we all don't understand how trade can enhance human rights and it can do so directly, indirectly, and over time, right? And I would argue that China teaches a lesson that we do have more leverage with North Korea, um, but I think we're losing that leverage, but that doesn't mean that it will directly enhance human rights. And in fact, it can have simultaneously terrible effects on many human rights. But it doesn't seem to me that the problem is with the farmer, the problem is us, that we didn't do a good job of educating the farmer <laughs> about the relationship between trade and human rights, um, which is complex and, and not so black and white, right? Um, I have strong views on it, which is I think more trade over time tends towards more human rights, but it depends on the human right, and we just can't bully China into changing its, you know, that authoritarian regime is determined to stay in power, more trade, less trade, whatever we do. Given that that's the reality, how do we have more leverage over China on these issues? I believe it's by partnering with other nations um, to, to work together to change the behavior of China, but we're not doing that. Um, and I think that's been the worrisome problem. I think it's very hard um, as more China, I mean, I was recently in Switzerland and I, it looked to me like I saw an awful lot of Chinese tourists. So ch more Chinese people have the right to freedom to be in other countries, to get educated in other countries. I hope they'll learn something about democratic values. That's me mostly. What a long way. Thank you. Um, yes, gentlemen in the back, and then we'll take a question from the uh, 
government. Uh, I wondered, uh, in Taiwan, are they addressing the situation in transportation, such as uh, airbag issues by using digital technology to track and follow problems like this and require repairs to the vehicles? It's an international issue. We have the problem here, we have missiles. And the discussion has been generally fairly decent, I understand, in how you deal with this. We now have a new situation with problem with aircraft repairs and aircraft <coughs> issues on a new aircraft uh, after certification. Uh, are they looking at this in Taiwan uh, for U.S. Uh, you know, aircraft? And are, are the, say, Toyota and Lexus vehicles that have suffered many problems with uh, unintended acceleration, has that been addressed at all? Mm -hmm. And I think digital is a way of solving that. I, I don't have many specific details, but I do personally work on two cases that may be relevant. Uh, one is uh, we do use distributed ledger technology. People call it blockchain. Feel free to continue calling it blockchain. <laughs> but I'm going to say it's a distributed ledger. Uh, so uh, we, we're using DLPs to, to track supply chain. But we, uh, honestly speaking, we start with um, data that is not in the private sector, but rather like people's measurement of air quality, water quality, like atmospheric free of privacy concern data. But still that is very important because when um, Dr. Aronson said that Taiwan's number one in the global open data index, I want to um, emphasize that open data in Taiwan doesn't only mean open government data. It means open data from the citizen scientists, from the private sectors in a true collaborative, data collaborative way. And so how to generate trust between a supply chain of a manufacturing of a um, you know shipping uh, line of uh, the so-called the, the code um, storage between um, a manufacturing of a food to its final safety space and organic food and things like that all of this needs uh, people who don't have implicit trust in each other to contribute data to a common pool that people trust that cannot be um, mutated by, by any other party and when it makes sense to use distributed ledger technology, we do use the distributed ledger technology. And so Taiwan is, um, I think, one of the most advanced place in these blockchains for, for governance. Um, um, maybe we find Estonia who retroactively renamed their um, EIB system to these two say that they run on blockchain before the term blockchain appears. I think we can't really uh, fight with that. But in any case, we're, we're really uh, progressing in using um, distributed ledgers uh, to give a Sectors. The other thing uh, that I mentioned about the sandbox system is really the sandbox system is a data collaborative system designed to uh, have trust of the, the inspired, for example, self driving cars in our, uh, just like the NCB, we have a proven ground for self driving cars and other kinds of vehicles. And again, the data arrangement is such that people who partner in such a data collective do have not just the visibility to each other's data, but for private data, they also have the ability to ship algorithms to one another and run the algorithms locally by the data operators and give out statistics that we can mathematically say is provably um, true or true to a uh, even uh, reasonable doubt that uh, people did not break down uh, during their proving ground experiments in the sandbox. And so it, that's a lot of technical detail, but basically we incentivize by giving essentially one year monopolies free from penalties uh, from the law in exchange for such data uh, collaboratives. And so that's the two cases that I have that may be tangentially related uh, to the question that you have. Yeah, also, um, this is actually, Aronson's question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, one can yeah. start right at the question of this. Madam, Madam Minister, mm -hmm. um, how do you, and, and again, I, the bravery is so apparent to me, how do you address the openness, the trust that, that you hold so true with your own security services? Yeah. Well, very carefully. So <laughs> <laughs> what uh, is the solution? Well, the, the solution is really a hack. Um, <laughs> so as part of my radical transparency working position, I don't even look at state secrets. No state secret passes my office. Uh, my office has a dedicated personnel to handle confidential information, uh, trying to any state secret whatsoever. And when there is a military drill where the cabinet members are asked to go to the bunkers, I just take away the heart. And so <laughs> <laughs> this is called physical 
isolation, right? <laughs> so basically, I don't know anything about state secrets, and therefore I cannot accidentally compromise them. I'm not advocating that everybody in public suit is going to be people working on national security. But uh, for example, my, my work on cybersecurity and so on, I work on the journal of how one everybody going into specific cases, which actually hit pretty hard on OSN and other Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Richard to uh, read off one of the questions. I think the second one on disinformation looks particularly interesting. Yeah. All right, so a threat of disinformation is that people could be persuaded, not necessarily that they are. How can Gun Zero help reveal how influential disinformation actually is? Okay, so I get to wear my city cover tech because the question asks about Gun Zero and the government. Um, which gives us a much wider range uh, to talk about. Um, there are certain limitations to what the state can do uh, for disinformation without going into state propaganda or censorship of information and so on. But the Zero community has came up with a pretty good uh, innovative solution, uh, and it's called COFAX or collaborative fact checking, uh, and it's a bot called COFAX, COFAX bot. And so many people go to the COFAX website, which is COFAX.g0b.tw. It's not a government website. Uh, that basically asks people uh, to install uh, um, bots, basically, that bot is friends. And whenever they see on uh, WhatsApp-like channels in Taiwan's called line, right, it's everywhere encrypted, so the state doesn't get to, to view what's inside the envelope. But nevertheless, whenever people feel unsure about any information that people have passed to them, they can just simply forward to that bot. And that bot will forward it to a group of collective fact checkers that basically does two things. First, anything that's flagged by two or more people gets a public URL. So that basically anything that's trending before they get weaponized, it gets exposed. And so people inoculate against that potentially weaponizable misinformation and so that it doesn't actually turn into disinformation. And the second thing is that once the collective fact checkers adds up uh, the you know materials and write a clarification message to fact check if it's false, partly true, or things like that, the bots gets back to everybody who forward that to, to, to the bot. And so it adds to the conversation without censoring anything away. And there's many derivative projects. There's one on BBC and I think CNN called the Maybe Bot, the, the LPJ uh, bot, that basically you can invite to your, your family chat rooms uh, and channels and basically it takes every incoming message it doesn't store it but it compares what's the entire database of COFAX and if it's a fact check that's false above a certain similarity it just says uh, on the family chat channel that this is fact check is false things uh, things are not what what this says it's are and please uh, view this to, to no more and so I think the idea is that this saves people from the um, effort to correct their parents and their children's um, a bot that stuff for them. Uh, and it's so effective that we can literally see the trending map of the disinformation or misinformation campaigns, and also that the line accompanies. So after seeing the success of this civic tech innovation now agrees, I think by June or so, to, in, to basically have this as one of their built-in features, so that uh, for anything, any message you can long press and forward it to the COFAX and other fact-checking community as a built-in function of the line app itself, and they're going to dedicate a tab for real-time clarification so that there's a balance of views for everybody using that end-to-end -end encrypted system. And the beauty of this is just as how we solve spam. We don't solve spam by um, forcing everybody to disclose people's email content to the government. Rather, we ask all this uh, email uh, agents, what we say, the user agent, which is the vendors to put a flag button to so that people can flag something as spam and therefore voluntarily contribute to the international spam uh, blocking uh, network, the spam house project. And once it's rated as spam, it doesn't, it's not censored, right? It still goes to your mailbox. It just goes to the junk mail filter so that you can check it when you have too much time. So it doesn't waste people's time on average. And this is the kind of agreement we're reaching with social media companies such as Facebook that's going to bow down the virality of things that are fact-checked as false uh, by the International Fact-Checking Network of which Taiwan is a member. Thank you. Um, it's quite a nice follow-up and ask uh, to what extent that is being adopted by other countries because it mm -hmm. seems like such a widespread mm -hmm. problem, especially during elections, which mm -hmm. uh, especially in India right now, there's a lot of disinformation. 
that's right. So uh, I don't actually manage the compact uh, project, but from what I've seen on GitHub and, and the public uh, development that it's been ported, <laughs> adapted to WebPack. And I think um, any local, because this really is a social construct, we have uh, received a lot of interest from like the Code of Japan and the Code of Code for All Network internationally. As long as there is at least like three or four people who agree to meet every week uh, to look at people's Black Vancouver uh, messages, you can get this crowdsourced fact checking going. And so I think there's many early attempts at the moment, but I don't have I, I don't have uh, any numbers as of whether it gets to the same degree as mine uh, in Taiwan. I think that's also because one is not operating in the entire uh, world. It is entirely um, within the East Asia region. And so we basically chose Taiwan as the pilot site and see whether this digital accountability design actually makes the disinformation issue at least more visible uh, to the research community. And it does work. I, I'm sure that other easily encrypted channels like WhatsApp and so on will learn from this uh, effort. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? So I'm wondering, uh, Taiwan is, is complying with the Sustainable Development Goal, and it has also complied with several other conventions like the HDDPR and the uh, UN um, Three Covenants. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, um, what is the rationale between why Taiwan is so committed to complying to these international conventions, mm -hmm. and where do you see this compliance going in the future? Well, because we can help. And I mean, if we're not compliant ourselves, there's no way that we can also help to our diplomatic allies and like-minded countries. And so we really, SDG index, like everything, uh, our CSR reports that are SDG index, I think is ranked one of the highest in, in the world, and also I think over 50% now. Uh, and our university also index the work in social responsibility, again, within the SDG framework. So if you look at our voluntary national report that only outlines what the state commits to do, but if there's very comparable reports on a dashboard, we're going to introduce the dashboard shortly that you can just select any of the goals and see the different sectors in Taiwan and what they're they're capable of contributing to. And we're also giving out regional awards like the APSIPA, the Asia Pacific Social Innovation Partnership Award, that gives awards not to specific organizations or individuals, but to unlikely partnerships uh, between across uh, across countries and across different sectors in advancement of the sustainable and so uh, I think our top prize this year went to the Sigong Dewa uh, Fashion Village uh, Lab that is part of the UN Creative Sea Network. And so to answer your question, first that we really have to be compliant because it's a common language that allows sectors to talk to each other. It's just common vocabulary. And the second thing is that because we're willing to help, we also use this as a extended way to mark our existing efforts that you can see in our BNR and other social responsibility. Yes. Inside. Gentleman over there. My name's Steve Traver. I work uh, mostly security issues related to um, Taiwan. And of course, our primary concern are physical kinetic attacks and making sure the country is prepared to deal with that. But um, our discussion today gets to a whole <coughs> different sort of threat that we're very worried about um, in supporting our allies in Taiwan, which is a, a cyber attack, which we brought up. And, and I don't want to get into the details of the <coughs> nature of that attack and what might happen and so on and so forth. What I'd really like to hear from someone who is dedicating their life to working with the young people mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Uh, uh, any kind of a sense from you, uh, do the young people in Taiwan uh, have any sense of the threat that they're under? And um, do they feel a sense of urgency and 
just so this is this is my question. Do they feel a sense of urgency in being prepared both individually and as part of a generation mm -hmm. that's going to have to confront this thing? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. The answer is an unequivocal yes, uh, and but I wouldn't say that uh, before 2014. I think 2014 really is the watershed year uh, with the Sunflower Movement and the Occupy Movement, uh, where young people literally occupy the parliament for 22 days uh, to put a stop to the cross strait citizen trade agreement that was um, just fast tracked through the parliament because somehow constitutionally uh, loophole um, makes that it doesn't have to be subject to the same process that uh, all the bilateral agreements have to go through because Beijing is a domestic studio. But in any case, uh, in, in 2014, that constitutional loophole was viewed um, you know, with some tolerance by general population, but the Occupy really brought it to everybody's mind that we do have this constitutional loophole going on, and people are willing to go to the street, half a million people on the street, many more online, and I was one of the per persons who maintained communication uh, framework during the Occupy. And so after the Occupy, I would say the younger generation do feel a sense of urgency of protecting our democratic way of life, and also that it made, um, for example, cyber um, security a very popular choice of career uh, for, for young people. Um, really, being a white hat hacker in Taiwan ensure that you can get paid well, and five to seven percent of all government project procurement goes to cyber security. That you get to meet with president, official minister personally once in a while and, and so on so that they don't fall to the dark side, which always has cookies. Uh, but in any case, <laughs> yeah, it, it made cybersecurity and uh, general awareness a very popular time in a young generation. And they do see PRC more as a conquering force. They don't have any conception of the overlapping sovereignty and other kind of um, ideologies that basically uh, still uh, is in the mind of people who still remember the martial law. We've actually uh, come to the end of the program. Um, I want to just uh, make a couple of announcements. One, this is the last week of class, so I want to thank those of you who I know you're very busy, those of you who uh, came to hear the uh, uh, minister and others speak. Um, I also want to say that uh, the photo exhibit, there are only eight of them right here, but we are working on uh, setting up a larger 40-plus uh, set of photo exhibits um, in the future. So stay tuned. We're still working on trying to get that, to have an exhibit here at the Idea School on that. A, uh, a, 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 you know, a kind of a journey of US-Taiwan relations, some of the key, some of the key uh, elements here. And uh, also we are having lunch right after. Yes. Thank you for waiting patiently right, uh, right outside in the hallway. We collect it and you can sit uh, outside or come back here. But most, uh, and also a thank you to IIIT for advertising the event and joining us. And, la and finally, uh, let me just say what a tremendous honor and privilege it was to have you, mm -hmm. Ms. Chang, to grace us with your presence. And really, I can see that you can ignite a kind of a a movement almost uh, on the sort of digital governance. And, uh, and and even I'm so inspired and excited by some, you know, I'm, I'm someone who is a political scientist who's uh, shunned technology as much as I can, but you have really made it uh, so accessible and so exciting. So thank you, and thank you also to uh, my fellow panelists here. So please join me. the live stream, I'll get back to your Slido questions on Slido platform itself uh, by this evening. So thank you very much. <laughs>